first I'd like to thank Finance Minister Sri Mulyani for her leadership and personal partnership to advance critical work of the G20 during this challenging time for the global economy. We recently saw the fruits of our efforts as the World Bank Board approved the creation of a critical new fund to fill gaps in pandemic preparedness and prevention. This is something for which both Minister Mulyani and I strongly advocated, along with many others. And I'm proud that the United States will provide $450 million as an initial contribution to help launch this important financing mechanism. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused devastating human and economic consequences, and it's unlikely to be the last pandemic we face. Stronger health and finance collaboration will enable us all to be better prepared to respond to future global health emergencies. Throughout my first trip to the Indo-Pacific as Treasury Secretary, our work has been motivated by two overarching objectives set forward by President Biden. In Japan earlier this week, here in Indonesia, and next in Korea, we're first reaffirming and strengthening some of our closest relationships. Second, at all of the stops on this trip, we're advancing policies that will strengthen and grow America's economy and middle class. President Biden and I agree that we will be stronger in responding to the immense global challenges we face today by acting together instead of going it alone, and that America plays a critical role in leading and coordinating these efforts. Our greatest challenge today comes from Russia's illegal and unprovoked war against Ukraine. We're seeing negative spillover effects from that war in every corner of the world, particularly with respect to higher energy prices and rising food insecurity. That was reflected in yesterday's CPI data, which showed almost half of the increase coming from higher energy prices. Inflation in the United States remains unacceptably high, and it's our administration's top economic priority to bring it down. We should also be mindful of the spillover effects of Putin's war, the effect it's having in countries that we're already facing heightened vulnerabilities. The United States remains unwavering in condemning Putin's war and the atrocities being committed by his forces. The international community must be clear-eyed in holding Putin accountable for the global economic and humanitarian consequences of his war. Since the start of the war, Russian forces have continued committing unthinkable destruction, especially across Ukraine's eastern region. Russia's actions are not the actions of a government that upholds international norms and laws. Representatives of the Putin regime have no place at this forum. We stand firmly with the people of Ukraine, and I look forward to welp welcoming the Ukrainian finance minister to this G20 meeting tomorrow. Throughout my trip to the region and here in Indonesia, we will also continue our conversations about what we can do together to help others around the world impacted by Russia's war. This includes addressing food insecurity and the design and implementation of a price cap on Russian oil. A price cap on Russian oil is one of our most powerful tools to address the pain that Americans and families across the world are feeling at the gas pump and the grocery store right now. A limit on the price of Russian oil would deny Putin revenue his war machine needs and would build on the historic sanctions we've already implemented that make it more difficult for him to wage his war or grow his economy. It will also aid in maintaining the global supply of oil, helping put downward pressure on prices 
for consumers in America and globally at a time when energy prices are spiking. Energy security is a key element of President Biden's foreign policy agenda focused on American workers, businesses, and consumers. That agenda has been an area of focus on this trip. In Tokyo, I had the opportunity to meet with Japanese leaders to discuss the strength of our bilateral economic relationship. By deepening our economic ties with allies like Japan, Korea, and many of the countries represented here at the G20, we can make our economies and our supply chains stronger and more resilient and avoid the sort of costly disruptions that have driven up inflation in America and globally. This is the type of partnership that strengthens the international system we've built while also protecting ourselves from some of the fragilities in global trade networks that we have seen over the last few years. This is particularly important in the Indo-Pacific when we consider the challenges posed by non-market tactics pursued by countries like China. We also know that global challenges stemming from Russia's war in U Ukraine have been particularly acute for emerging markets. It's troubling to see how the war is contributing to higher energy costs, food insecurity, and hunger for the most vulnerable globally. We've already taken swift action to help mitigate food insecurity, including through our call to action for international financial institutions to redouble their work and through our leading role with the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, to which the United States is donating an additional $155 million. But more needs to be done to help the most vulnerable, and this is a key message I will be emphasizing at these G20 meetings. Given the deteriorating global economic conditions since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a key objective of this trip is to push G20 creditors, including China, to finalize debt restructuring for developing countries now facing debt distress. The United States will also provide a grant of $70 million to the IMF's Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust to further enable the IMF to make zero interest loans to the world's poorest economies. So there's important work to do here this week in Indonesia, but throughout we will remain focused on delivering on our commitment to confronting the world's challenges with our partners. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions.